Good morning. Good morning. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is also Jeff, not Pastor Jeff. And if you have trouble telling the difference between the two of us, I'm just a little older. In fact, I found out this week that I'm actually old. <laughs> we have these two little neighbor kids that run over to our house whenever we're outside. And uh, if I'm sitting on the patio, the little girl, she's six, she comes over and explains things to me. She explains how her little scooter works, and she tells me, it's not a scooter, Jeff, it's a Vespa. Oh, it's a Vespa. And she explains to me how come she's got a Band-Aid on her knuckles and why she's still wearing her pajamas at noon outside. But the other day she was over, and she was looking at me, and she looked at my feet, and she looked at my face. She kept looking at me and not speaking. And finally, she, and I knew the wheels were turning. And she finally said, Jeff, your feet are okay, but your face is really old. <laughs> Thanks. And just then, my wife walks out the door onto the patio, and she looks up to Chris, and she says, Jeff's face is really old. <laughs> so I'm not older. I'm old. Now, for those of you that have been here for a while, you know we've been methodically moving through the Gospel of Luke, and we're going to continue that today. And uh, this particular section of the Gospel, Pastor Jeff is labeled as the ministry in Galilee. And it's all heading to chapter 9 and verse 51, where everything changes. Because it's at that point when Jesus is going to leave Galilee, and it says he turns his face towards Jerusalem. For those of you that are following electronically today, we're going to be in the New American Standard Bible for our uh, passages, they will also be up on the screen. I know Jeff likes to preach out of the New Living Translation, but like I said before, I'm an old dog, and new tricks don't come so easily. Our text today is Luke chapter 8, verses 22 through 39. However, I want to start with a part of verse 35. And they found the man sitting down at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. They found the man sitting down at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And as we go through the text today, I want you to keep this image in your mind. Sort of a backdrop to all the events that we will consider. This moment, with this man sitting is a destination. It's not so much a geographic destination, it's a spiritual destination. Because here is a man hopelessly lost in a horrendous state, unable to do for himself in any fashion. His need is so overwhelming that no one in his community can do anything for him either, and they've tried. But as we will see, where humans can't, Jesus can. So let's start with verse 22, and we're just going to go through here verse at a time. Verse 22. Now on one of those days, Jesus and his disciples got into a boat, and he said to them, let's go over to the other side of the lake. And so they launched out. I think it would be helpful for us here to grab a little bit of context. One of the great things about the Gospels is that many narratives appear in more than one. And this particular one also appears in Matthew and Mark. And so if, if we were to read all three accounts, it enables us to get a fuller picture and it gives us a broader view. So in Mark, we learn that Jesus made this remark in the evening at the end of a long day teaching and interacting with a large crowd of people. And from Mark, we also learn that there were other boats, not just a boat, but boats. There was a little flotilla, if you will. Now, you and I read this, and we think, 
oh, a nice little boat ride across the lake. However, for those who heard the request to go to the other side, not so much. Let's consider three things. First of all, there's going to be work involved. The Sea of Galilee is not huge, but it's big. It's about one-third the size of Lake Mille Lacs. So across to the other side was about a seven or eight mile trip. And unless there was a nice breeze to catch the sail, we're talking about two or three hours of hard labor. And if the wind was from the east, the direction they were traveling, it was all hands on the oars. It's work. It's the end of the day. Maybe Jesus isn't the only one who's tired. And then secondly, except for a few fishermen, these are mostly desert people. Spending a couple hours on water at night was definitely outside their comfort zone. Dave Bricky, the pastor at Church of the Open Door in Maple Grove, points out something quite fascinating about the relationship of the ancient Hebrews and water. When you or I form a mental picture of evil or something that represents evil or a malevolent chaos, we tend to think of an image something like this one. We personify it. However, for the ancient Hebrews, they'd form a completely different picture of what evil would look like. Theirs would look something like this. Not personified. For them, chaos, uncontrollable danger, even evil, was conceived with the image of a raging sea. A situation of extreme danger and total helplessness. Now, theologically and culturally, for them, it goes way back to the very second verse of the Bible. Water was the formless void, the vast emptiness that had yet to be touched by God. Now, I know there are some of you who have been to the Sea of Galilee. There are some of you here who have been on it and have been in it. So you know of its unusual geography, 700 feet below sea level and surrounded by hills that tower up to 800 feet above it. That's one picture of it there. It creates an interesting weather pattern. Cooler winds coming over the top of the mountains descend to the lake where the warmer water is. And you know what happens when cold air and warm air meet. They don't get along so well. And the people of Israel, excuse me, and when it descended on the lake, it could create very sudden, out of nowhere, violent gales. And this weather pattern was no mystery to those Jesus was asking to come along. Following him this particular evening would be dark and it could be dangerous. And the third thing is, the other side, that meant Gentile territory. It would have made no sense to them. Why in the world would we go over there? The people of God, the people of Israel, they're here on this side. The people on the other side, we'll stay separated from them, thank you very much. Going to Gentile territory would not fit into their understanding of the ways God work. But here we are. Even though it may mean hard work after a long day, even though it may mean having to overcome fear and stepping way out of their comfort zones, and even though it violated their understanding of how God did things, Jesus is bidding them to follow. He's about to show them some amazing things. He's about to demonstrate works of power that will shake their world. And he's about to expand their knowledge of who he is and who he has come to minister to. They don't know any of that. He does. And who went? I think those that chose to went. Remember, it's boats, not boat. I know you're all bright enough to catch the application here and I don't want to beat it to death, but I will. I do believe there are times 
when we, as Christians, we miss opportunities to follow Christ. We miss opportunities to be used by him. We miss opportunities to witness his workings and be involved in his purposes, because at those times we're not willing to step out of our carefully cultivated, cared for comfort zones. Let's keep reading. Verse 23. But as they were sailing along, he fell asleep, and a fierce gale of wind descended on the lake, and they began to be swamped and to be in danger. And they came to Jesus, and they woke him up, and they say, Master, Master, we're perishing. Someone had a photo of it they saved for us. Good cameras back then, color film and everything. <clears throat> but you do get an idea of the boat. They're not that big. Maybe 25 feet long, held 10 to 12 people, and they did have a crude sail sometimes. This particular painting is by Rembrandt. You know that Rembrandt painted, painted over 40 paintings of gospel or Bible scenes. It was his way of giving a commentary. It's how he expressed how he was reacting to the scriptures was with art. So sometime if you want to Google Rembrandt and look at all the paintings that he did that depict Bible scenes, it's a great, it's a great uh, use of your time. Master, master, we are perishing. And in Mark, we see that one of the disciples actually asks, teacher, don't you care? that we're perishing? Matthew, Mark, and Luke, <clears throat> not John, write in such a way that we, the reader, get to see how the disciples discover who Jesus is over time. You and I, we know. We even know what he's going to do. They don't. And remember to them, this chaos that they're in, this raging lake water, these big waves, this danger is potentially more than just wind and waves. It's evil. So what they are really asking Jesus is this. Aren't you worried like we are? Aren't you afraid we're all going to die? Don't you realize how much danger we're in? Do you even care about what's happening? It's natural. We do it. We see all kinds of bad things happening around us. At times we sense evil lurking about, or we experience the wind and the waves that life throws at us. And we wonder, like the psalmist, are you there? Do you care? Can't you see what's happening, God? He is there. He does care. And he is well aware of all of the happenings of humans. However, he will not fret with us. He won't worry with us. He will not enter into our fears. And he's not interested in us remaining in a state of anxiety, and he is not interested in us spreading our fears to others. Don't forget what you remembered from when you were a little tiny kid. Chicken Little did eventually find out the sky wasn't falling. Let's read on. Verse 24. He got up, and he rebuked the wind and the surging waves, and they stopped, and it became calm. And he said to them, where's your faith? They were fearful and amazed, saying to one another, who then is this that he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him? I'd like to deal with Jesus' question about faith first. Where's your faith? Matthew, it says, how is it you have no faith? 
And Mark adds, why are you so fearful? In fact, the way Mark, the word that he uses it, Jesus is actually saying to them, why are you guys such cowards? Now, I've actually heard someone preach on this passage once who said Jesus was chastising them that they didn't command the wind and the waves to obey them. Yeah, I don't quite think that way. I mean, if you think that you're supposed to stand up and tell the wind and the waves to obey you, you're on a different path than I am. Myself, I don't believe that was his expectation when he was asking about where's your faith. I think the question was more along the lines of, who are you with? Who do you belong to? Didn't you just hear me say the other day that the Father has numbered the very hairs of your head? Don't you know your times are in the Father's hands? You see, these are the very things we must remember when we have to navigate some difficult storms that swirl around us. We must remember who we're with, who we belong to, that he is aware and concerned about the most minute particulars of our lives. And we must remember that our times, our destiny is in his hands. Now let's consider the wind and the waves. Disciples do ask the ultimate question. Who is this guy? They knew he was a great teacher because they'd heard him teach. And they knew he was a prophet. They'd watched him heal many. And they had the examples of Elijah and Elijah to draw on. Now for them, they grew up hearing the stories of the great prophets from Kings Elijah and Elisha, who both healed and rose people from the dead, so they knew he was a prophet. But they had never heard of an example of anybody who could make violent storms become calm at his command. And when I say they ask the ultimate question, it is the question that must be resolved by every person. Who is Jesus? Who was he? Who is he? Now, there are some who reject Christ so vehemently that they refuse to acknowledge he even existed. You know, a legend at best, a made-up myth at worst. However, for those who have not deluded themselves to that degree, to those who at least realize there's as much historical evidence that Jesus existed as there is that Caesar marched his army across the Rubicon. For those people, C.S. Lewis famously pointed out that you only have three options as you consider this. Now, many of you here know C.S. Lewis as the writer of children's books, Narnia. But when he lived, he was more known as a theologian. And mere Christianity, if you read the first two chapters of that book, it's one of the greatest uh, passages of apologetics we have in our Christian library. C.S. Lewis says, if you consider Jesus, you've got three options. Option number one, he was insane. Now, that's not a crazy thought, no pun intended. You know, even his family at one point He's talking to a bunch of people and people are surrounding him and they want to hear him. His brothers and sisters come to take him away because they think he's lost it. And you think about this. If someone was to come in here today and claim to be God, claim to be the son of God, you'd have, the, you'd have doubts about their mental state, would you not? And the other option is that he was a deceiver, a liar, that he was like an evil cult leader trying to gather all these people around himself. Well, that would be for financial gain and power. Well, if you examine his life, he wasn't seeking any finances. He wasn't trying to exercise power over his followers like that. In fact, he was even willing to send people away. He made it sometimes hard to follow him. And then the third option is if he wasn't a liar, and if he wasn't insane, then 
He was who he said he was. The son of the living God, the one who has power over the laws of nature, power over the unseen realm, the one who rose from the dead. Some people call that <clears throat> trilogy Lord, Liar, or Lunatic. So let's keep going now. We're in verse 26. The storm has calmed down, and they're making their way across the lake, and they get to the other side. I got a feeling you got to climb up to the top of the hill when they get there. But they sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. And when they came out onto the land, he was met by a man from the city who was possessed with demons and who had not put on any clothing for a long time and was not living in a house, but in tombs. And we also know from Matthew and Mark that he would gash himself bloody with sharp stones and that he would run around at night howling and screaming. Now imagine a man running around your neighborhood, naked, bloody, screaming, and who liked to hang out with dead bodies in the cemetery. And according to Matthew, was extremely violent if you got too close. 911. So far gone, so deep in the darkness that living among others, living in town, living in his own house was not possible. This guy's in a bad way. Let's see what happens. Verse 28. Seeing Jesus, he cried out and fell before him and said in a loud voice, what business do we have with each other, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for it had seized him many times, and he was bound with chains and shackles and kept under guard, and yet he would break his bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert." Let's look first at the words spoken to Jesus. He knows his name. He knows who he is. And remember just an hour or so earlier, the boys in the boat were wondering who he was? They just got their answer. And he says, don't torment me. In a little bit, we're going to read about the abyss. Then Matthew adds, don't torment us before our time, before the time. See, they not only know who he is, they also know their ultimate destination. They know a judgment has been pronounced, just not been executed yet. They know they and their master will be thrown into the abyss, the bottomless pit, and they know when they're there, it will not be a pleasant experience. They know it's coming. They're sure hoping it's not today. Then let's look at a little broader description. He could not be bound with chains or shackles. There is a belief among some liberal theologians that demons don't exist, the devil doesn't exist, and that all the supernatural events surrounding Jesus are simply misinterpretations by the gospel writers. They present the gospel writers as superstitious folks with an unsophisticated, unscientific understanding of what they were witnessing. This idea was famously championed by a man named William Barclay, a professor of divinity and biblical criticism at the University of Glasgow. <clears throat> by the way, he is deceased now. He's met his maker. So he'll have his answers, his questions answered. But anyway, his New Testament commentary, basically trying to eliminate all references of supernatural events in the Gospels, sold over one and a half million copies. Lots of people want to read about the Bible not being a reliable text, not being the Word of God. To him, to Barclay, this man had no demons. 
He was just psychotic, and this account is simply Jesus healing a troubled mind. I get it, but if I was to meet Barclay, now I'm no expert on demonology. In fact, in my entire life, I've only once dealt with someone who unmistakably was possessed. That's 45 years just once. But I do have a couple of questions I'd ask Dr. Barkley, where he's still alive. First question I'd ask him is, does mental illness give a person the strength to break chains and shackles? Does mental illness give a person the supernatural ability to recognize that Jesus was the son of the Most High God? And to know his name. you have never seen the guy before. And does mental illness involve begging not to go into eternal judgment. If one is inclined to believe this is just an account of mental illness, fine. But if so, then you have put yourself in a position to pick and choose what, if any, parts of the gospel are true accounts. Not for me. I believe the gospel accounts are true. I believe they are logically verifiable, And if one were to read them with an open heart, that person will will come to know Jesus and become forever changed. Verse 30. And Jesus asked him, what's your name? What is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. And they were imploring him not to command them to go away into the abyss. There's a very interesting dynamic here in Jesus' question. Jesus is not asking his name to become informed. He's asking for the name purely for the benefit of his disciples. In Israel, in the time of Jesus, there were exorcisms and attempted exorcisms. It was common practice. And they had a theology, a commonly accepted set of beliefs that surrounded this whole practice of exorcisms. And two of those beliefs are very germane to our text today. The first belief was that the closer a person was to God, the more likely they were to be successful in casting out the demon. And the second belief was, if you could get the demon to tell you his name, that was proof that you were more powerful than the demon. Jesus is in teaching mode right now. He's saying to all of those who came over in the boats, pay attention, boys, this is important. You'll also notice that the demons are begging him and not to command them because they must obey his command. He has authority over them and they know it. Let's keep reading. Verse 32. Now there was a herd of many swine feeding there on the mountain and the demons implored him to permit them to enter the swine And he gave them permission. And the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. I don't really have time, and I don't really want to go into the whole thing about the pigs and the permission and the drowning. However, a Roman legion consisted of four to 6,000 soldiers. However, the word legion itself could also just be an idiom that meant many. But we know from Mark there was over 2,000 pigs. And it says that they ran away and reported. They ran away and reported. They went to the country and the city. They ran away and reported. I don't think they were reporting the miracle and how happy they were for the demoniac. I think they were more likely reporting. Some Hebrew guy came over in a boat and just destroyed our entire herd. We've lost everything. Imagine you're a farmer, and you own a herd of 2,000. Could be cattle or pigs or whatever. Some guy shows up, does some spiritual mumbo-jumbo, and your entire herd dies right before your eyes. You're not going to be happy for anybody. I 
And then we get to verse 35. The people went out to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus, and they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting down at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they became frightened. Now remember earlier I asked you to keep this scene in the back of your mind. Now, I can't prove this, or I cannot, and I also cannot back it up with other scripture. But my belief is that when Jesus said, let's go to the other side, he knew. He'd heard the cries, not the actual physical screaming and howling, but he heard the cry of the heart in his spirit. So he determined the destination. We've got somewhere to go, boys. There's somebody over there that needs our help. Let's go. And even though the demons had driven this man to unimaginable depths of depravity, the man had enough control that when Jesus stepped onto the shore, we learn from Mark that he ran up and bowed down before him. Now, when I see the picture here of the man seated at Jesus' feet, clothed and in his right mind, three truths come to me. First, here is the entire gospel in a microcosm. Jesus coming from a far country to rescue the lost, then clothing us in robes of righteousness and allowing us to learn at his feet and to have our minds renewed. The second truth that I see is that this is a picture of the destiny of every believer. There is a time in our future where all spiritual forces of evil that are invisible to us now will be vanquished. Then, according to Revelation 19, we will be clothed in dazzling linens. We will be at the feet of Jesus, at his throne. And we will be able to ask him all the questions we've never had answers for. And we'll be in our right minds. Think of all the nasty stuff that floats through your mind. You know, the thoughts you wished you never had, the thoughts you wondered, where did that come from? The thoughts that make you realize you truly are a fallen creature. All those thoughts will be gone, never to return. Think about that. And the third truth I see is we see the results of someone who has had an encounter with Jesus. It does not matter how far you have descended. It does not matter how self-destructive you have been. It does not matter if you are full of self-loathing. It does not matter that you feel hopeless against your addiction. It does not matter how hard or bitter or angry you are. Run down and bow down to Jesus. He will transform your life. He will give you new life. He will give you a new life. And like the man who had the legion, he will cover your shame. He will teach you how to live as you sit at his feet, and he will renew your mind to understand things you never could understand before. He replaces confusion with clarity. He replaces aimlessness with direction. And he replaces apathy with purpose. This is what Jesus does. This is who he is. Yes, he did it 2,000 years ago to the legion, but he's done it throughout those 2,000 years to millions, and he still does it today. Amen to that, right? Amen. Now, before we continue, uh, just a little side note on the man being clothed. Ever wonder, where'd the clothes come from? Like, did they bring an extra set with them? I mean, where, where'd they come from? Now, my daughter, who... I'm so grateful is here today. Some of you know my daughter, Jenny. She's a much more accomplished student of the Bible than I am. That's humbling, by the way, when both your children can kind of overwhelm you with their knowledge of the word compared to your own. Anyway, she tells me that if I really want to get the full impact of what it means that this man is clothed, I should study the theme of clothing 
throughout the entire scriptures because clothing is important in the Bible. From the first mention of it, and God fashioned for them clothes, correct, for Adam and Eve, all the way to the very last day when we are clothed. And there's tons of references to clothing all throughout the scripture. I'll leave that up to you. Now verse 36 and 37. Those who had seen it reported to them how the man who was demon-possessed had been made well, and all the people of the country of the Gerasenes and the surrounding district asked him to leave them. Go away. For they were gripped with great fear. So he got in the boat and he returned. We don't have time to really camp out on these two verses or the last part of verse 35. However, these people reject Jesus. They push him away, but they don't do it out of anger and they don't do it out of philosophical differences. They do it out of fear. So let's remember, when we see people rejecting Jesus, when we see them trying to push him away and everything to do with him away, even if they are loud and angry, it's highly likely they're motivated by fear as much as anything else. Let's not look at those screaming for Jesus to leave as enemies, and let's not return their hate to them. Let's see them as being afraid, and some of them are very afraid. And finally, verses 38 and 39. But the man from whom the demons had gone out was begging him that he might accompany him, but he sent him away, saying, Return to your house. Return to your house and describe what great things God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. Now, I have to admit, I have really struggled with these last two verses, not struggled in the sense that I have any problem with them, but they're very emotional to me, and I've struggled rather to try to condense them down to one thought, this little ending scene with a man begging to accompany Jesus and Jesus sending him, commissioning him instead. It's so full, both theologically and practically, it's hard to get down to one thought, but I am going to just end with one thought. If you've been touched by Jesus, if he's done great things for you, if you've tasted his blessings, telling others about that, just that is enough. Telling others the wonderful ways he has shown you love and cared for you is enough. You don't need to say more. Your humble testimony is powerful. And he can work with that. Allow me to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love that is so great. You were willing to send Jesus from the far country to seek us out, to rescue us, and to transfer us from the kingdom of darkness into your kingdom of light. Thank you.